comenzar. Muy buenas tardes. Esta es otra edición más del Seminario de Ética, Derecho y Política Pública. Como siempre, el objetivo de este seminario es explorar la dimensión normativa, ética, filosófica de algunos de los problemas públicos más relevantes en la agenda, no solamente de México, sino del mundo. Eh, y pues difícilmente hubiera sido, aunque planeamos esta presentación desde hace tiempo, difícilmente hubiese sido más oportuno el momento para tener esta discusión después eh, de lo que hemos estado dialogando en México en torno a los mecanismos de participación ciudadana y democracia directa, consultas populares, etc. Así que pues es un gusto enorme para mí darle, eh, presentar al profesor Nenad Stojanovic. Uh, how do you, Sto Stojanovic? Stojanovic. Stojanovic. I should have asked you first. Nenad, Nenad Stojanovic, eh, quien ha sido profesor en la Universidad de Lucerne, de Lucerna, eh, ahora es profesor en la Universidad de Ginebra, ha sido miembro del Parlamento en uno de los cantones eh, de Suiza y ha trabajado pues, ampliamente en temas de la teoría democrática y pues este es un, un nuevo proyecto en que está comenzando y pues seguramente va a ser una discusión muy útil para él y para nosotros. Eh, la presentación va a ser en inglés, lo he presentado a él en español porque entiende, habla un poco de español. Eh, así que me tomé esa libertad. Eh, bienvenido, Nena. Es un gusto que estés aquí con nosotros. So now we can switch to England, uh, English. And uh, thank you for, for being here. Thank you. Gracias. Uh, thank you, Claudio, for this invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, here in Mexico. Uh, generally speaking, Latin America is. Uh, an important part of the world when we speak about direct democracy. So it's a great pleasure um, to be here with you and thanks for uh, coming to listen to me. Um, so the, the topic of my talk is uh, Democracia Directa Sin Populismo. Uh, probably I should have put a question mark uh, after this uh, title because it is an open question. Can there be a direct democracy which is a non-populist? So let me first uh, start with a couple of uh, very basic uh, introductory uh, remarks about first what do I think when I say populism and what, what do I understand under uh, direct democracy? So. Uh, there is a large debate in uh, the literature in the past months and a couple of years uh, about what actually populism is and how can we define it. So it's a big debate. I will not go into that debate. Um, there are some also positive connotations of, of uh, populism. Uh, for this reason, I, I, I think it's important to, to underline here that the kind of populism that I have in mind is problematic for democracy. Uh, and I, uh, uh, I, I take here one of many authors who have written on populism recently, uh, Jan Werner Müller, uh, a professor at Princeton, um, who, who says that in the definition of populism there are two core elements, uh, which is on the one hand uh, populist movements, pop populist leaders uh, say that they are anti-elite, they are against the political, economical elite of populism, so that's something uh, of, um, of their country, so that's something that you can uh, surely find in, in all uh, uh, populist movements. And then there's a second aspect, it's anti-pluralist, in a way that populists, uh, they speak in the name of the people, and they understand this people as something homogeneous, not as a Plural, plural, pluralist body, and it is precisely the combination of these two elements, and in particular this anti-pluralist aspect of uh, populist movements and populist uh, parties, leaders, uh, that is uh, problematic for, uh, for democracy, because democracy needs uh, one of the, so to say, preconditions is, is to accept pluralism that characterizes uh, our uh, societies. So this uh, uh, rise of populism that we can uh, observe in many parts of the world, in, 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 
past years, it's very often connected with this idea that there is a crisis of democracy. And by crisis of democracy, we mean, in particular, uh, the, the crisis of uh, political, traditional political parties, the people have don't trust anymore, um, politicians, uh, traditional parties, um, etc. So if you, I, I just put here a couple of uh, uh, covers of, of, of books recently published um, in English here, but you can also find it in Spanish, uh, uh, having as a topic this idea that there is a crisis of democracy. So how can we address this crisis of democracy? And we can see in, in the literature like two very opposing answers to this question. Because one is going into a direction that, to say that uh, there is a crisis of democracy because the uh, outcomes of this, the results of democracies are not satisfactory for, for, for people in terms of justice, equality, welfare. So uh, there are people who say that we actually need less democracy. Uh, so a kind of epistocracy, the rule by or of the knowledgeable, the people who know. Uh, so that is precisely the position of this Mr. Um, Jason Brennan with his book Against Democracy, which has been a lot of, uh, I, I, I'm sure it has been translated into Spanish as well, or at uh, least, so. you know, but in German, Italian, French, it has been translated. So uh, he's a political theorist um, in Georgetown uh, who openly says we, 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 democracy doesn't work and what we need is is, is that people who vote can only vote if they know what they are voting about, so you have to take a test before voting, etc. So, so I won't go into that, but that's one possible direction uh, uh, or approach to address the so-called crisis of democracy. The other approach is goes into opposite direction and says that what we actually need is not less time democracy, but more democracy and more opportunities precisely for ordinary citizens to get involved in politics, so more participation of ordinary citizens. And it is in this context that comes this quest for direct democracy, as, as seen as, as, as being much more uh, respectful of, of, of what uh, ordinary citizens want of politics. So now here I'd like to just to specify or clarify a little bit what I mean by direct democracy. Uh, I checked that yesterday with Claudia that that's also something that you understand here when you say democracia directa, but not everywhere it's the case. So just to, to be clear, so I don't mean this ancient direct democracy where people would gather on the square and raise hands in order to, to vote laws, etc. What I mean is a modern version, which is uh, not that direct democracy would 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 be uh, would replace uh, a parliament, so representative democracy. But it's uh, it, it would supplement. It would go together um, with with institutions of representative democracy. So, uh, to be even more precise, we could speak of a system of semi-direct democracy. But I would avoid this and 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 just speak of direct democracy straightforward. So basically, the idea that people. Uh, occasionally can be called to express their opinion through uh, referendums um, uh, without going through the parliament. But again, you don't, we don't eliminate the parliament. So there is this quest for more direct democracy, but now at, at the empirical level, it is quite striking to see that all, or at least almost all, uh, uh, or I could think of, of, of no populist movements or, or parties who don't demand uh, direct democracy. At least in Europe, this is a very much the case uh, in, in many countries with populist parties. Uh, uh, in Austria, the, the, the populist right-wing party, uh, which is now a member of the um, coalition government, uh, it was one of the things that they insisted in the coalition with Christian Democrats that uh, Austria should adopt more direct democratic mechanisms. The same thing in Italy, 
now we have a government of two populist parties. One is right wing, rather, the other is rather center left. But the center left five star movements also insisted we need more direct democracy. So in Italy today, you even have a minister for direct democracy who is a member of the government. And the same thing in France, in Germany, etc., where uh, basically all uh, populist movements demand this direct democracy. But on the other hand, in in political theory, in, 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 in theories of democracy, if you read different authors that, uh, if you had the chance to read my paper, I, I, I quote some of them, Nadia Urbinati, Thomas Cristiano, Ellen Landmore, etc. You will find really a lot of skepticism towards direct democracy. Uh, and the uh, theorists of democracy, um, when the skepticism is linked to, the, to these three main components, uh, uh, has these three main components, which are on the one hand the well-known argument that the people are too um, too ignorant to, to, to vote on specific uh, policy measures through referendums, so it's better to leave them vote on general issues like on in elections to elect a party and then let's leave the parties or the party uh, that wins the election to, to govern the, the, the country. Um, that's, for instance, something that you can find in Thomas Cristiano's argument about the division of labor that, that people can, should, should vote in, on some big principles but not on, on precise policy measures. Uh, then there is also the well-known uh, uh, argument that direct democracy would, would, uh, would transform the democracy into a tyranny of, uh, of the majority, that uh, groups that are minority will always be target of... Uh, uh, of, um, of majorities and will always lose the popular votes. And then there is a, a critique coming especially from the strand of uh, deliberative uh, Democrats, the deliberative democracy theory, uh, who uh, say that direct democracy does not allow for deliberation. It's simply you, you vote yes or no, but uh, people are not really involved in the process in the sense that they you know, deliberate about the various options, etc. Et so uh, this is just a brief overview of this critique of uh, direct democracy that you can find, uh, more information you can find, of course, in, 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 uh, in the paper. So here we face, in other words, a puzzle. Uh, so what is the impact of direct democracy on populism? Uh, the mainstream above thinks that it is enabling, it is something it would enable populists. And the arguments for that are in the mainstream literature in democratic theory. But again, as I said, uh, also if you listen to populists themselves, that's, you know, empirically, it's populist leaders who want more direct democracy. So in a way, the ambition of my uh, project, because it is a, a research proje project that I officially started only a month ago, so I, I cannot uh, tell you here how uh, the results will be in four years from now, but the ambition of my project is to, is to uh, argue that direct democracy can also be non-enabling uh, with regard to, to, um, to populism. So the, the goal of my project is to, uh, to, to elaborate a theory of uh, direct democracy that can resist this charge of populism uh, but not an abstract theory, but also to elaborate an, an institutional model how this uh, direct democracy should look like in order to be as resistant as possible towards this uh, charge of populism. Uh, and again, I have in mind uh, uh, this vision of populism, this de definition that sees populism as a problem for democracy in case that if, if populists uh, win elections, are in power, that in the long run they might undermine the very institutions of democracy that en enabled them to, to be elected in the first place. This is also quite a challenge in, Claudio can say more about that, but in, in, in theories of democracy we don't really have a theory of direct democracy or, or there are only very few people who until now have, have done something in this field, so this is also a further challenge for, for my project. So I will offer now um, uh, a couple of, of, of main insights of what I intend to do, so I cannot go into too many details, uh, uh, but just a couple of main 
insights. But one, the first point is important to stress that uh, the kind of direct democracy that I have in mind is clearly not a top-down direct democracy where the uh, prime minister like Cameroon in, in Great Britain or the president like in France are the only people who actually can decide let's hold a referendum. That's a top-down, so the president decides. I guess this might sound familiar to you. So what I have in mind is rather a bottom-up direct democracy. So uh, it must be necessary to collect signatures that ordinary people are involved in the process by signing a popular initiative or a referendum. Uh, so it, it should come from, from, uh, from below and not from the, from, from the top. Uh, because precisely uh, uh, what you do see is that uh, when you do have a populist leader who has the power to call the referendum, he or she will tend to call the referendum basically only when they know that they're going to win. So this is not the kind of direct democracy that I have in mind. So direct democracy should involve some kind of uncertainty about the outcome. Then another important point is I don't have in mind a kind of direct democracy that you use once every 10 years, uh, as in the United Kingdom perhaps, or even every four years. No, it should be something continuous process. You should have a possibility, the, the people should have possibility to vote continuously on, on not necessarily big constitutional issues like, or uh, questions like uh, the Brexit in the United Kingdom, should we leave the European Union? These are big issues. But also on some more, uh, let's say, um, everyday issues that are still important for people like uh, health care reform or pensions reform or do we need a new airport or this kind of stuff. Um, or do we need a new bridge in our local community? So you do not need to have referendums only at the national level, you can also have that at local level. So let me now spend a little bit more time uh, on, um, on um, no, I, I'll spend it on the next slide, but one thing that is important is that the, the idea that in this frequent use of direct democracy, winners and losers are never the same, and I will explain in a, in a minute why, why is this important. I will also say towards the end of the presentation uh, how uh, there are some models quite recent, like uh, something I call the Oregon model, uh, that involve even more uh, uh, ordinary citizens in the, in the process. So I think that what, what Oregon has adopted um, eight years ago is something really innovative, and, and um, I think it's worth um, spending some time on, on, on that. Uh, and there are also many open issues that I don't have myself a clear opinion uh, at this point, like uh, if I say that uh, we need uh, signatures, so people need to collect signatures, there are some questions like, okay, should we pay, sh should we be allowed to pay collectors of signatures or, because in that case, you know, uh, uh, you, if you have a, 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 a billionaire who just gives money to people to collect signatures, he can, he can influence the uh, he or she can influence the, um, simply by, uh, so to say, um, um, the, the whole process. Uh, should you have a quorum, so like uh, a, a, a turnout in a referendum, which is required for the referendum to be valid, like uh, one third, or like in Italy, it's 50% of the voting population must uh, vote in order for this referendum to be valid. This is also. Uh, Compulsory voting is another issue in order to avoid uh, too low turnout, uh, so decisions made by a very uh, low number of people. Should you, should, do you need some kind of judicial review that the constitutional court can say if one or another uh, um, popular initiative is uh, in accordance with the constitution and if it's not, it's not allowed to be put on popular vote? Do we need some super majorities, more than 50% in some cases? So these are, there are a lot of open issues, but I put them here because of course, uh, in a way, the kind of project that I want to develop is is to have a model of direct democracy that includes 
checks and balances, so to say. It's just like in the United States in the late 18th century with the, after the revolution and with the new US constitution, they also feared um, representative democracy, like pure, okay, the parliament decides. No, so they introduced the whole system of checks and balances, so the president controls parliament or can veto parliamentary decisions, but parliament can also veto some presidential decisions, and then you have Supreme Court, et cetera, et cetera. These are precisely the institutions that already at that point were, you know, the, the people who, who the, the famous federalists, uh, um, they invented them in order to avoid that somebody like the current, you think some insights from his argument is um, perhaps show what I have in mind. Or we can also think of Claude Lefort and his idea, uh, his conception of the people, where the people is multiple, it's not a homogeneous body. In French, he says the people is infigurable. It's, you cannot really figure it out. It's somewhere, uh, this fluid idea of the people. But that's something that I think uh, a frequent use of direct democracy uh, can more easily, easily um, bring about. So, And now let me turn and, uh, and conclude by, because I want to have some time for discussion and for questions, uh, with this, uh, with the, with this uh, Oregon model. What, uh, what is it, what it is, and why is it um, important in my idea of non-populist direct democracy? So in Oregon, there is something called Citizens' Initiative Review. Uh, they started it like eight, 10 years ago. And uh, it's interesting because it combines sortition, random selection, I guess, uh, Claudio, the students had the opportunity to, to learn something about random selection or sortition, with the whole deliber uh, deliberative democracy uh, literature and, um, and people who do that, and the direct democracy. Because in Oregon, they have a lot of referendums every uh, every year, uh, and so what they did is they uh, they created the Citizens' Initiative Review, which is a body of uh, uh, 20, 25 uh, citizens, ordinary, ordinary citizens, uh, selected by lot, who during uh, one week, I think five working days, they have the opportunity to discuss about uh, a measure, about a proposal that is put on popular, in, po in popular vote, on referendum. So they, they listen to experts, uh, the people who are in favor, the people who are against. It's the classical uh, mini public, if you heard about, about this term, which is very present in, in, in this deliberative democracy literature. So it's a kind of mini public, in, in randomly selected, so in that sense, the representative of the society. Um, and, uh, and so they, they deliberate, they listen to different uh, reasons, etc. And in the end of the process, they write a statement, which is um, uh, one page. Uh, and really, you should see it. It's like the first half of the page, they, they have to summarize in an objective, let's say, neutral way, you know, what, what is at stake in, this, uh, in, in, in the next referendum. And then the other half of the page is divided in two. There is a, the, the opinion of the majority of this group saying, uh, majority or one part of the group saying why do they recommend to vote yes to this ballot uh, measure proposal. And the other uh, part of this group uh, explains the re uh, or, or gives the reasons to vote no. And contrary to, to other experiments with mini publics, and there have been a lot of them, the recommendations of, these, of this body of citizens, ordinary citizens, do not go do, into, you know, to the parliament or government and then parliament or the president can say, oh, okay, I'll take this into consideration or, or I'll just, you know, <laughs> I forget about it. No. It goes directly to other citizens, to, to, to citizens who actually have to vote on, who are called to vote in this referendum. So um, you, 
all citizens in Oregon receive a, a brochure, a, a pamphlet, official pamphlet, uh, in order to get information about, uh, about the referendum. And in, in the past, they would only receive recommendations of the, of the governor, of, of, of the parliament of Oregon. But now they also can see what the ordinary citizens recommend. So the question is, why does this Oregon model has a non-populist potential if combined with direct democracy? Uh, well, there's a, a, two reasons. First, experiments with mini publics, uh, not in Oregon, but other like even the, the, you even had a, a mini public before Brexit in, in, the, in, the, in the UK, so rather like small experiments. They show that there is some evidence that perhaps at the beginning of the process, the, this, these ordinary people are rather in favor of a populist uh, proposal. You know, like let's let's kick out the foreign uh, the criminal foreigners out of this country. Okay, so you you know most people are in favor. But after five days of you know, uh, deepening the issue and, 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 and listening to different arguments, they understand the complexity that there are also some other rights that are at stake, uh, some human rights, some rights to, uh, to have a, uh, a fair procedure in front of a tribunal, et cetera, et cetera, depending on the issue. And they understand that the topic is much more complex than what they thought in the first place. So generally speaking, populist proposals lose in their strength after five days of, of deliberations. You still have a minority which is in, in favor, but majority tends to be against populist uh, proposals. Uh, and there is, again, there is some um, evidence uh, uh, from these mini publics from Switzerland, but also Brexit, etc., uh, confirming, confirming this, uh, this hypothesis. And now the second aspect is, okay, but what will the voters do? Will they really follow uh, the recommendations of this group of citizens? Well, this is an empirical question, it's an open question. Uh, but of course, if voters, or at least, at least some voters would follow these, um, uh, these recommendations, recommendations, this would uh, lower the risk of populist uh, decisions. So uh, the, uh, the surveys and, and some studies did in Oregon show that uh, uh, there is a considerable number of voters who do say that they have read uh, the statement by this group of ordinary citizens, 43% in 2016. Uh, six out of ten voters who have read these recommendations, they say that they found them somewhat or very helpful. Um, and in a way, um, we, could, we could think of, if you think of voters who are, typically voters who are potentially those who would support populist proposals, these voters, they don't trust what the governments uh, says or what the parliament recommends. But the hope is that they might be more open at least to listening or to uh, following what uh, other ordinary citizens, people like them, so to say, have, um, have recommended after uh, uh, considering the complexity of, of the issue. That's it. Thank you. Nana. Thank you. Okay, very well. I'm sure people in the audience have lots of questions. So who would like to start? Pedro. Uh, 
generates outcomes while fighting the other three powers, being legislative, executive, and judicial. And a fourth power, let's say. The only thing I do not have clear is what type of barriers or which type of uh, mechanisms are there. What kind of mechanisms are there that can um, separate the direct democracy from the intervention of the executive power, legislative, or judicial? Because let's think about it. The executive power in this institution, which would be also a combination of an indirect with a direct democracy, couldn't this, um, if not the executive, the legislative, have some type of output or input in the discussion or in the people who integrate the referendum, let's say, uh, pay certain individuals to be there, talk, and try to um, put a lot of uh, emphasis on their views and just work as a mechanism in order for them to uh, obtain the type of preferences they want. The, the, the question in general would be, how would you uh, separate this, this fourth power or this institution for it to not be affected in terms of policy or money by the other powers that could also have some type of input in this society? Yes, thank you a lot for your question. Well, of course, uh, there are always risks uh, um, you know, involved in any kind of uh, institution, democratic institution that you can have. So the, like the power of the money, of course, like people with a lot of money, uh, they can influence the process. Uh, uh, just like they already influence in many places uh, the, you know, uh, what the parliament does, you know. A lot of members of parliament are, uh, depending on the country, uh, either corrupted or they, uh, they receive indirect support by some uh, lobby groups uh, for their campaigns, etc. So once elected, they're not really completely free to do whatever they want because if they really do whatever they want as members of parliament, they risk losing the support in next elections. And as you know, uh, most members of parliament, once elected, uh, they already think uh, how can they be re-elected in, in three, four, or five years, depending on the. <laughs> okay, so this is a problem that already exists now, and it is something that, of course, uh, especially in the U.S. context, uh, has been proven that uh, you do have sometimes lobby groups that uh, have so much money to, you know, influence a referendum campaign by uh, by buying ads on television, newspapers, etc. etc. So it's actually influence. Well, this is then the question, okay, how do you reg regulate? Uh, you need regulation. So you need uh, 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 transparency, the first thing. So, so it, as, as a minimum, it should be known who, who finances the, let's say, yes or the no uh, camp in a referendum campaign and with how much money. So that would be the minimum. By the way, this is something that we don't have in Switzerland, which is a problem. But there has been a, a popular initiative, again, Dialog Democracy, demanding precisely this transparency. So there will be a vote in Switzerland in about one or two years on that. Uh, you could even go a step further and say that, uh, you know, from a single individual uh, can finance with, with uh, only $5,000 a given campaign, not more. So you, 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 you put a ceiling on, 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 the, on the expenditures. So they are, you know, if, if we think that this is a problem, there are ways to, um, to fix it, or at least to, to avoid the most uh, negative consequences of that. So this is the first part of the answer. The second answer is that I don't see necessarily direct democracy as some kind of fourth power which is in conflict with the others. I mean, of course, I, I still want parliament and the executive branch to have a say in the process. So it's, for me, it's fine if the parliament says, you know, we recommend on this referendum to, to vote no. Huh? And it, it's fine for me if this is published in the official uh, pamphlet, which is already the case in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the States, in the United States, with a lot of direct democracy, in Switzerland as well, etc. Not only, a parliament can also, um, um, in cases of popular initiatives, so it's, 
um, when you when you when you ask for an amendment of the constitution, when people ask for amendment through signatures, uh, well, the parliament uh, can say, you know, well, this goes in the good direction, but it goes a bit too far. So we propose a, we have a counter proposal as parliament, which goes a little bit in the direction that the, the, the people demand, but not as as far as as as, as, as these uh, as the people who signed this initiative want, so in the end, uh, you might end up with having a popular vote where, as citizens, you you can say uh, yes or no to the popular initiative itself, but you can also say yes or no to counter proposal made by the parliament. Let's say this kind of compromise solution. And you can also indicate which one of the, of the two you prefer in case that both get the majority. So the parliament can have a, a, a say in the, in, the, in the process. It's not completely separated. What's important is that the parliament and the government cannot uh, uh, forbid or, let's say, block holding a referendum. So no, if, if the, uh, the process has been, the procedure has been respected, signatures have been collected, etc. Then there is a certain amount of time, um, many months, you can leave to Parliament to, to make a counter-proposal, etc. But in the end, uh, uh, the Parliament or the executive branch cannot block holding a popular vote. I think that's something important. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, my question goes uh, more to the, like the in informal, uh, it's like a little bit more, uh, it's like Pedro's question, but on more on the informal side, thinking about uh, uh, clientelism and vote buying, uh, because uh, I, I read the paper and I think it's, it's kind of Eurocentric in a way, because uh, <laughs> or Swiss centric. Yeah, 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 Swiss centric. Uh, yeah, because I think, like, in the Latin American context, having more uh, direct democracy mechanisms could open uh, the possibility for interest groups uh, uh, beyond lobbying and stuff for just proposing something from below and then buying out the election and doing what they want, skipping the, like, the the mechanisms that uh, representative democracy has. So I want to think, uh, to know what you think about that. Well, in a way, I also already answered to, to of course, I, I, I can see that this is a risk. But one thing that I always ask people who are skeptical towards direct democracy, you should ask, is the situation better now when you have only representative democracy, when you only have parliament? Uh, this, is it better now? So is, is Parliament like a you know, body which is, uh, where there is no clientelism, no lobbying? No, I don't think so. Uh, uh, in, in, in a way, uh, the, the basic idea of direct democracy is precisely the opposite. It's to, to have a check towards the Parliament in a way that sometimes Parliament, because uh, in many countries, if not in all countries, it is uh, influenced by, by, by interest groups, by lobbies, etc. I don't say that all members of parliament, you know, uh, but in many countries it's a problem. So sometimes parliament may, makes decisions which, which are, you know, reflect the preferences of lobby groups, but not necessarily of, of ordinary people. So it is good in, to have the possibility that the people have the possibility to collect signatures to say, no, we want to oppose this law. We want to. We want a popular vote, and let's see if, if, if really a majority of the people is satisfied with this, with this law. Uh, yeah, but I, I think like what I meant is like when the ordinary people are very uh, susceptible to to selling out their vote for uh, because they have low income and stuff like that. Like I, I think that it, it can even get worse with direct democracy. Okay. Well, this aspect of your question goes towards rather in, in the direction of, uh, you know, is democracy something that can work in a, in, in, in a poor country, basically, and it's, you know, it's an old topic in, 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 in political science and uh, political economy, et cetera, et cetera, so people really try to see. Um, but in the end, uh, we should always ask ourselves, so, okay, what is the alternative to having democracy in, in sense having people have 
the right to vote. Um, there are some alternatives that have been, have been at least uh, imagined or, uh, or, or, or let's say um, not implemented but put on, on paper, uh, like the proposal by my colleague uh, Claudio to randomly select citizens, you know about his proposal, randomly select citizens who should get the right to vote and then allow these citizens to, be, to get information, to be kind of informed and uh, in a way educated, uh, not educated but um, instructed uh, and, and, and receive all information they need in order to vote really you know, uh, by knowing what they are doing. Uh, that's an interesting proposal, but uh, it's still on paper, and uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see if, uh, if at some point in the future uh, it, it, it could be implemented. But f that, that's always the question. So, okay, what is the, uh, the alternative? And I, what I don't believe is that uh, having a system of uh, direct democracy as a supplement to representative democracy would make things even worse than they are if if they are already bad in a given place. But again, that's you, you might say this this is perhaps a speculation. That it is perhaps um, linked. Uh, let's say when you when you said it is a eurocentrist and I would say perhaps Swiss centrist uh, kind of approach. It, could be. Uh, one of the reasons I came to Latin America is also to, to, to be able to, to, to learn more about the discussions in Latin America about uh, direct democracy. Uh, but there is, let's, let's say, uh, one possible uh, critique is that in order to have such a system work, you need a, a given political culture. So it's, it's the idea that the people should already be kind of a, you know, it should also be a question of, of, of political culture to, uh, to sign the referendum, to, to go to participate, to go to inform themselves, to resist uh, being um, influenced by lobby groups. Uh, okay, that's, uh, but uh, here my answer is, you know, you have to start from so, somewhere. And, and, and even the Swiss, you know, the Swiss, were not born with direct democracy. At some point, they also had to introduce it and to learn how to use it. And to so, the political culture is something that develops gradually. And of course, it can take years and perhaps decades. It's a, it's a long process. But you you need to start from somewhere. Hello. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, when I read your paper, I actually thought, well, maybe we should be Switzerland and we can avoid populism. Um, the three uh, components uh, that you say that are beneficial for this emerge from Switzerland or at least from a multi-ethnic or multilinguistic society. Um, for example, the demos enhancing uh, thing, I actually think that the referendums can be can generate a lot of polarization, um, and not just in um, populist context. It, it, for example, in Mexico, um, you know, the airport, we are in a populist context, but it is a very controversial uh, thing, a very important decision, and I think that in itself it could be um, a polarizing uh, thing. Um, also, I noted the political cultural thing. The three components, um, the um, demos enhancing, the instability of majorities and minorities and the ball function, they have like some, they have that in there, the political culture thing. And I was a little bit um, confused with your um, with your justification of the compulsory vote thing, uh, that you said that um, I think that you are maybe undermining a little bit participation because you said that maybe the low turnout may be a good thing. And that's also Switzerland because Switzerland has not a very high uh, turnout in at least presidential elections compared to the other European countries. So I think that maybe if you are like promoting political culture in that way, uh, the justification for the compulsory vote uh, should be changing 
in that way, political culture, not saying like the the people that is not that informed or that it has not a lot of um, that it's ignorant is not going to vote. So I think that maybe uh, it's okay the thing with the political culture, but it should be congruent with the compulsive vote thing. I don't know if I'm. Thanks, Being thanks cleared. a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's good that you asked the question about compulsory voting. Uh, actually, that's one of the topics on which I haven't made up my mind yet to tell you I'm really uh, in favor or against. I think I tend to be rather skeptical, but not. Uh, no, I'm in, in one year from now I could be fully in favor of compulsory voting. I think, actually, uh, uh, in one month from now, on 8th of December. Uh, I will be, I organize a workshop in Geneva on compulsory voting uh, with some people who have worked on that, Annabelle Lever, uh, Matteo Bonotti, uh, Antula Malcopulu, uh, etc. Uh, precisely because myself I want to, 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 to go deeper and to, to, to uh, because one thing is that, uh, uh, of course we are all, you know, if you are for democracy, you, you cannot be happy if you see a low turnout. Like sometimes, in, even in Switzerland, we have uh, like 30% turnout, and then this 30% decides by 52% majority, which means that in the end, 15% of those who have the right to vote decide. Okay, uh, but I think we should not um, focus only on quantitative aspect of participation, like is the turnout low or high, and say, well. I don't know, 60% turnout is better than 50, and 50 is better than 40, etc. You also have a qualitative aspect, which means how well informed are the people who vote. So if I, so if I ask you, you know, do you prefer a turnout 70%, but where people have no clue what they are doing, you know, just, just randomly voting yes or no, or 40% turnout, but where everyone is informed about the issue. I, I think I would prefer 40%, but, uh, but again, uh, uh, we should strive for the ideal to have both quantitative and qualitative high. Uh, the question is how to achieve that. And, and, uh, and, and one uh, hope is that uh, if you have a lot of these mini publics associated with the exercise of direct democracy, it would allow a lot of people over time to be involved in the process, to be able to discuss at least during a week, to understand the complexity of politics, and, and it would be in a way a civic education, which, uh, which we do need. And, and, and uh, if I now think of uh, Switzerland having really a lot of referendums at the national level, cantonal level, municipal level, uh, uh, if we had something like uh, Oregon has, uh, it would be a great improvement and innovation, in my view, of, of the kind of democracy that we have in the country where I come from. You, you had a question from the beginning, but you didn't have it. Thank you very much. Um, my question goes more in terms of um, what would be the issues or the topics that can be subjected to this direct democracy, because in terms of uh, Putting everything under consideration of, of, of people might be problematic. For example, I'm thinking about taxation. So maybe if a, a modification of the law, of the taxation law, is voted by the general people, probably the majority will say, yes, let's avoid taxation. And I was thinking more in terms of could you be thinking about a list of issues that are worthy of putting into the consideration of, of the direct democracy or not? Or have you thought about it? And another thing is um, who's going to call for, for these issues to, to, to be voted by, by in, through direct democracy? And another thing is what happened, for example, um, another, thing, another thing that I would like to ask or to think about in this model is what about if the, the will of the people is not feasible to, to be implemented? For example, they, don't want to, they want to build up an airport, but there's not enough money to do so. 
So to what extent this direct democracy end up being just as an expression of the people rather than impacting, making an impact in the institution, in, at the institutional level? So, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, th that's also an important question. Uh, should we allow any question to be put on popular vote? Um, I would rather think of issues like, uh, you know, uh, more, even more extreme than, than the one, because taxation is actually, I think it's a, I'll, I'll tell something about that in, in, in a minute. But I thought like, you know, let's suppose uh, we, we say, uh, okay, let's have a new article of a constitution who says uh, uh, only white people should rule in this country. You know, is this something that we should allow? Or uh, should we have death penalty? Um, which is of course um, <laughs> different uh, depending on which side of the world you, you live, but in Europe today uh, no country allows for death penalty and it's a kind of taboo to, um, to, to propose something like that. Uh, or uh, should we um, um, uh, have a ban on the construction, constructions of mosques for Muslims or any other religion? So this kind of issues. Uh, well, I think that we, we should have a very a high uh, protections against uh, this kind of manipulation of direct democracy uh, that potentially puts into question some very, very fundamental human rights. Uh, actually, it's in, in Switzerland, uh, the, the uh, constitution says that the, some very the core norms of international law and fundamental rights cannot be subject to referendum. This article of constitution actually could be subject of referendum. <laughs> so you could have a popular initiative wanting to abolish this. Uh, so in the end, you know, people uh, in a democracy, uh, there's always a risk, but uh, you should have protections uh, against that. And in, at least in the, in the Swiss case, we do have that with regard to fundamental human rights. Now, the question of taxation, I actually think that it's a good thing that people can vote on, on, the, on, on, on the fiscal policy. And, and I think it's a, a wrong supposition to think that they would always vote to have low taxes. No, the empirical record in Switzerland, I, I, I mean, I always, you Switzerland because you don't have a lot of countries where you have a, fr a frequent regular direct democracy. Uh, but you did, have, you did have a lot of uh, votes on fiscal policy where people accepted to pay higher taxes or were against proposal to lower the taxes when they understood that paying, uh, uh, there was for instance a, a, a referendum on, on, on the introduction of the uh, uh, IVA, you call it also in Mexico, IVA, okay? So un until early 90s, it was 0% in Switzerland. And then at some point, you know, government said, you know, we need money f for our budget, et cetera. So let's have it at 8%. I think you, you, here you have 16%. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So th the idea was to have 7 or 8% uh, IVA, uh, tax and added value. And the people said yes, because they understood that uh, in order to, for the state to be able to finance uh, you know, the construction of streets, of uh, railways, of uh, hospitals, of uh, uh, schools, etc. They need money and they said yes. Other, other referendums where the majority of parliament, precisely those who were under influence of lobby groups and, uh, and you know, businesses, etc. They said, oh, let's lower the taxes for, for corporations, business, etc. Uh, so majority in parliament said yes, let's have lower taxes, and then majority of people said no. <laughs> so if, you, if people can actually decide also fiscal policy, that makes them more um, responsible about, you know, the, the kind of state they want to live in. Because I can accept to pay higher taxes if I know that the state provides for a lot of things, uh, schools, hospitals, uh, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, it, it, it makes you more aware uh, how does the state function? So the state needs money to finance something, and 
and and uh, otherwise you you take a debt and that is something that you pay for many many generations etc cetera, etc cetera. and there are even some empirical studies in switzerland showing that uh, in in parts of switzerland where where people can have um, because even in switzerland not all municipalities or cantons have the same let's say, a degree of direct democracy. In some places, you cannot vote on, on the budget uh, of your municipalities, or you have to, it's a very complicated. In others, it's also auto, it's automatic, uh, like every increase of taxes is put on referendum, okay? And there are some empirical studies showing that the people in municipalities where they have more say in, in fiscal policy are actually happier they could measure the, the, the grade of happiness uh, and that they are more satisfied with the environment they live if, if they have a say in, in the process. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I have a question that um, rises from the experience of Latin American countries, particularly with the problems of development. Um, we are a, a set of countries that have struggled with development uh, throughout their whole history. And this, in many occasions, has uh, led us to very opposing uh, thoughts from different parts of society about the strategy, the, the strategy that we should follow to reach that development. So, in a lot of ways, I think that when implementing direct democracy, there are two dangers uh, that I would like uh, you to to expand upon. First of all, um, I think that whenever a society is divided, very, very divided on a particular policy or on a particular subject, it can lead in direct democracy to a further division of these two opposing um, views on what should be implemented into society. And um, I, would, I would like to know, for example, in a situation where there is a very, very close, uh, a very close decision by one of those groups, should there be a way to, I'm, I'm talking about a situation where there is a, something very close to a tie, for example, 51% against 49% of the population, that can lead to even violent outbreaks if 49% of the population is not, um, does not agree with the policy that is being implemented. And on the other, on the other hand, um, I would like to know to which extent could be direct democracy, uh, a direct opposing force, force, sorry, a direct opposing force to the state whenever implementing new policies. So if the state wants to implement a new policy, and people do not agree with that policy, and that policy uh, gets banned, to what extent could direct democracy be a constant opposing force of the change in policy that the state could uh, go around implementing in a society and reach a place of stagnation of that uh, political change? Okay. Um, okay, the, 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 there's a couple of issues here. Um, Yes, it could be that direct democracy makes, let's say, uh, or, or there's more risk that uh, the reforms that a given state needs uh, take much more time to be adopted and implemented than in a typical uh, Westminster system like the UK. You know, UK is... If you are the party in the government, you decide a reform of universities. It is implemented within a couple of weeks, months, you know. No, there is no check. Majority leader or the party in the majority decides and it's implemented. The opposition can say whatever they want. They are in minority in parliament. And they go forward. Of course, if you have direct democracy, well, you would have the possibility of referendum. And then if you have a referendum, the people, uh, the majority can say, no, we don't want this reform. And then, you know, you have to start again. And, uh, yeah, that's true. But uh, I'm not convinced that it's a good thing to have uh, reforms that, you know, are simply an expression of the majority in parliament without 
considering what the minority says, I don't think that in the long run such reforms are really uh, have a good impact on society. Because, yeah. like in an extreme case, that, that's something what happened in, in, in Italy. You know, you have changing coalitions, changing majorities. Every you know four or ten years, you have a new reform of the education system, and you have to start from from uh, from from the beginning, so to say, every time uh, because because they uh, every government has a different idea. Uh, I, I think it's a it's it's a better system to have these things really thought about uh, um, uh, by by many different bodies, so not to have only the parliament deciding at least have two chambers of parliament deciding, which is already, I think, a good thing to have a second chamber ha ha have um, equal powers as first chamber because, you know, it's better to have different people think about, about a new reform than only one group of people. And then if you have the people, then uh, you, it, 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 it also obliges the, it has an indirect effect of direct democracy is, is that it produces, or let's say it provides incentives for members of parliament to seek compromises already in parliament in order to avoid the referendum. And I think, you know, seeking a compromise, it's a good thing rather than, you know, simply going forward saying, oh, we have majority of one seat in parliament, we go straight forward. Okay, that's one uh, thing that I want to say. The other one is that your question about the polarization, that there's a risk of polarization, and that's uh, somebody else uh, asked the same question. I didn't really answer it. Uh, okay, here the key insight is, 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 is this uh, slide where I spoke about changing majorities and minorities. Of course, on a single issue, you always have a, if, if the issue is really important, uh, sometimes you have also issues that are, you know, everybody is in favor, so it's, it's not polarizing. But uh, even in Switzerland, many issues are really polarizing. Um, and so, you know, you have people fighting themselves, oh, we are for the yes, we are for the no, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, you have a result. Somebody loses, somebody wins. And then you have, in a couple of months, another popular vote. And then you will have a different constellation, perhaps also polarization, but, uh, you know, on, on a different topic. So sometimes, uh, you know, what, what, can I, what example can I give you? Like, you can have a popular vote on... A typical left-right issue, which is like uh, uh, fiscal policy. That's typically, you know, the left want rich people to pay more taxes, the right want them to pay. Okay, it's typical left-right, so you have polarization between left and right, okay. But then you have another referendum on uh, whether or not to, um, to construct a new airport. Uh, um, and then you have construction of new airport, or, or let's say, or rather, that, because that's a topic that I had in my, uh, in my uh, canton, uh, uh, I'm in favor of, of uh, abolishing one airport that we have, because we don't need it. <laughs> because we have railway system, and we have two big airports in Milan and Zurich, and we don't need a, uh, to spend a lot of millions every year to, sub, you know, a subvention to the small regional airport that, uh, well, okay. So I, I'm in favor of abolishing this airport, okay. And I'm I'm from the left, okay. But on this issue, I will have many people from the left who will be against me, like the, the people who are close to trade unions. That's what I experienced. They told me, oh, no, but we have a lot of jobs at the airport. You know, a lot of people will lose their jobs. So in a way, uh, the left is divided on this issue because either people privilege environmental issue, they are for environment, or they privilege jobs, even if these jobs, um, you know, are the place that creates more pollution, etc. But they, they want jobs. Well, this is something that divides the left, and, and 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 perhaps the same thing will also divide the right for different issues. So, in other ways, you will always have a kind of polarization. But these, uh, the constellation of this polarization will always change, and people will not always be in the same group. Uh, uh, yeah, as, as they are in places uh, where you do have the polarization, uh, the typical polarization, like in the United States right now. Uh, but again, uh, I say, well, you do have that because they have at the national level only representative democracy, and, and so either you are the Democrat, Republican, polarized, 
uh, if you had direct democracy, you would have a different uh, dynamics. That's at least. And, and a last uh, answer to the question of Brexit. Yes, sometimes you do have a vote decided by a razor thin majority, 51%. And the question, okay, should that be the last word? In my, uh, let's say, approach to direct democracy, of course not. That's not the last word. In my conception, the people could always start the process again. If, if I mean, in the UK, uh, for me, it is really a problem that uh, there will not be a second referendum. And, and I don't understand that. I mean, uh, okay, the majority gave the mandate to the government to negotiate the, the, the exit from the European Union, but in my view, there must be a referendum on the final result of this negotiation. And in, the, in a place like Switzerland, this would always be possible to, you know, you can lose this time, and if you're really not satisfied, well, you can, you can, you can um, start a new uh, uh, procedure. It happened in Switzerland exactly four years ago. There was a referendum, uh, a popular initiative demanding to to limit a little bit immigration to Switzerland, okay? And they won by 50.3%. Exactly the case you want. Okay. Within a couple of months from, from then, there was a group of people who, who, who collected 100,000 signatures with a simple proposal, okay, we want to cancel this new article of constitution that was decided by 50.3%, we want to cancel it. And then, of course, there were people saying, oh, well, no, that's not democratic. You don't respect people's will. And say, no, no, we, we are completely doing what, what the constitutional and democratic procedure in this country allows to do. And, uh, and that's what, uh, what happened. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, si, si alguien quiere hacer una pregunta en, en español, uh, puede hacerla. Si, si, no, si no tiene gana de hacerla en inglés, pero I, I, I see that uh, we really speak excellent English, so, <laughs> but just, you know, don't, you know, if you want to ask question in, in Spanish, please go ahead, just speak slowly. <laughs> well, uh, now I'll ask in English. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, I, I, thank you for the presentation. I think it's a great project that you're developing. And I just have a question, I guess it's the, so even though I, I'm fully on, uh, on board with you, I am going to ask you a skeptical question, I guess. And the question is, or the comment, question, comment. So I'm not entirely, I'm, I'm not entirely seeing how the, how the proposal addresses the anti-elitist component of of populism. Just because, so in in, in my view, so populists are are angry or are against sort of like the the elites that economic elites political elites that are already there and that they claim they uh they corrupt the political the political process so that they sort of uh, uh interfere in order to uh to uh manipulate uh political decisions so in that sense they might be able to say the same about about referendums, uh, referenda, sorry. Uh, and, and so for instance, in, in the example you give, uh, you, uh, so, so, well, so that's the first comment. So, I, see, I'm, so I, I guess I would like you to talk a little bit more about that part. But, but so an example of that would be the, so you were mentioning that you weren't, you were still struggling with the question whether uh, people should be allowed to pay to, uh, to collect. So, so, so that, that, for instance, in my view, I, I would say if you want, if your case is that direct democracy can undermine populism, I think the answer to that question would be no, right? Because, because then that's, that's a practice that populists would be able to, 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 uh, to single out and say, okay, so see how it's the, the elites that are corrupting the, uh, the, uh, the process by, by buying basically uh, signatures, right? So there is a way in which the, the, the I mean, look, I guess you, you already know this, but you, you know this, but the, the way in which you, you design the, 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 the instrument has to be, uh, has to be addressing the, the, the complaint of populists, right? In a way, I don't know if I, if I, if I may make myself clear, but 
So I guess, how would you respond to, to, to that claim is my, my, my question. The claim that in the end, elites are going to, to try to, to toy around with the, with, the, with the instruments of direct democracy to, to do what they always do, which is to, to impose their will against the will of the people. Okay, so let me think about it. Uh, well, I, I see here two, two constellations. Like the first constellation is where populists are in power. Okay, they win elections, they form the government. So, okay. Well, in that case, having a system of direct democracy would uh, address this anti-elitist component of, of, uh, of populists themselves because uh, it would, it, or it might uh, uh, make it more um, evident that now they are the elite and that people are not in favor of their policies. Uh, because again, Remember what I said, that uh, I'm in favor of a bottom-up, not a top-down. So in my model of direct democracy, a populist who wins the election cannot simply say, oh, I want to have a referendum. To, okay. No. On the contrary, he, will, he or she, as a populist leader or the party, populist party who holds majority in parliament, will uh, have um, you know, a law you know, where they want to implement some populist measure or whatever. And then you can have a referendum against this law. So in other way, the, their rhetoric of anti-elites turns against them thanks to the possibility of direct democracy. I don't know if this makes sense for you, but that, that's the constellation where they are in power. The other constellation is, is where they are not in power. And... Uh, uh, well, the first answer is that um, in places where they are not in power, uh, populists uh, uh, always want direct democracy as, uh, or ask for direct democracy because they think that would be something that would go against those who are in power. Uh, but I see the, the argument uh, that, sa that says, well, um, if, uh, if the economic elites especially uh, want to... Um, Instru instrumentalize direct democracy, they can do that by buying or let's say paying people who collect signatures and one that you have signatures, you know, putting a lot of money in a referendum campaign, etc. Uh, here I must again, or I will not repeat what I answered in the first or second question about the, the question of transparency, of, of ceilings, of how much. So, so I, I, do need, I, I do think that you, we need regulations about that. And uh, what the signature collectors, uh, um, as far as they are concerned, um, I, also, no, I also tend to say that they, 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 they should not be allowed. But the practical problem that I see is uh, that sometimes you have uh, people who uh, collect signature, let's say, uh, like trade unions. Okay, what trade unions do uh, when they want to launch a referendum, they they don't pay people to gather signatures, but they simply have their employees going on the street to collect signatures. So in a way, it's the same thing. <laughs> uh, and, and so if you really wanted to, um, uh, you know, like if you're an employee of trade union, you, you said, okay, instead of working in office from 9 to 5 p.m., you go on the street and you collect signatures. And, and then in a way, he's, this person is paid as an employee of the trade union, but instead of sitting in the office, collect signatures. So in a way, it's an indirect payment. And the question is, okay, how do you, uh, it's, it's, let, let's say at, at, the, at the theoretical level, I, I, or let's say level of the principle, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, here, this is the question how to implement this, how to control that people are not paid for indirectly or directly. Uh, but I do agree the ideal would be to have people who collect signatures because they believe in the cause. And you do have a lot of people who do that. I, I, 
I know a lot of them who really, you know, uh, go and spend their whole Saturday collecting signatures for free because they believe in the cause. That would be, of course, the ideal type uh, uh, how direct democracy should work. But again, the risks exist. Well, quite quickly, uh, I have two questions that, I, that are kind of interrelated. The first one has to do with polarization also, and is that if the method of the direct democracy or your proposal of direct democracy necessarily avoids uh, this polarization or is a matter of issues, as my classmate has said. And the other one is that if populism hinges on the combination of anti elist um, uh, this anti-elist trend or an, an anti-pluralist uh, trend, how does uh, direct democracy avoid the combination of these two factors? Well, it avoids the combination um, well, on the anti-pluralist side because contrary to the populist rhetoric of the people as a unified homogenous body, well, let's put it differently. Uh, imagine you know, I'm a, a populist leader, okay? So you know, I say, well, the people want this, the people want that, etc. But if there is no check what people really want, you know, I can go on with my rhetorics and always claim to speak in the name of the people. Whereas if, if there is a possibility to check, well, do people really want what I say they want? Well, then you have a popular vote, people vote, and tip, on a typical issue, you will have majority and minority. So, uh, you know, I might see that as a populist leader that, well, majority is actually against me. So there is this uh, I idealized homogenous people actually doesn't exist because um, that's what the results show. And even if I'm in the majority, uh, you know, you cannot uh, say that all of a sudden f these 49% who uh, are against me, that they don't exist. No, it's a half of, of the people that you, uh, you, you, you claim to represent. So it, uh, again, it's, it's, in, in my view, it is, uh, it is something that undermines this populist rhetoric uh, that imagines the people as a homogeneous body. Uh, um, yeah, that's, that's on, 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 on that side, on the anti-pluralist side, and the anti-elitist side is something I just answered before. So. But yeah, perhaps I should be more coherent in, in explaining why does it address simultaneously both uh, aspects of populism. I have a question. Uh, thanks a lot for, for the presentation. Um, I, I have kind of a problem to see the point of direct democracy because uh, I think that, and I, I think that you addressed that uh, before, is that it is important that the society that adopts this this method uh, has a political culture um, that is developed, that is highly developed. And I think that is a great risk to put this, uh, this method in societies that doesn't have that political culture. In Latin America we have many examples in which direct democracy has been used by populist government uh, or, or populist uh, political uh, politics, oh, I don't know. Yeah. but I, I mean, it, it, it has been used for, for the cause of populism. So if you have to uh, uh, use this direct democracy in societies that are highly developed, highly educated, educated and, highly, uh, and have a, a high political culture, Maybe those societies don't doesn't need that because they are highly developed, highly educated, and have and have a, a high uh, developed political culture. 
So maybe it's kind of, of kind of like putting a, a cherry in, uh, over the cake, but the, at, at the end you have a, a pretty cake already. So uh, I I think that the world is the, the majority of the world is underdeveloped, not highly developed. So maybe it, it is important to. Um, uh, um, come with a with a, a method that serves to the majority of the world, not not to this uh, uh, these highly developed countries that are, aren't the majority. Maybe I am underestimating the problems of, of Europe. Maybe I am under, underestimating the problems of, of Sweden or Switzerland or uh, UK or. or but that's the concern that, that I have. So well, that's it. Thanks. So if, if I can, um, in a way, um, put your question differently, what you are actually saying, it's interesting. Actually, you say the countries that have direct democracy, <coughs> or like a country like Switzerland, these are actually countries that don't need direct democracy because they have already the cake. So it's only you know a nice thing to have a cherry, but you know, they're already highly developed and have a welfare and a, a good employment and good education, whatever. So the countries that, uh, uh, in other words, the countries that uh, uh, don't need direct democracy, they have them, whereas the countries that perhaps might, might need direct democracy, they cannot have it or would not function there because the people are not educated enough and they don't have political culture, etc. Okay. Well, my first uh, reaction here is uh, I would be very, uh, yeah, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, for me it's problematic to divide the world in those who are developed and educated. To use a different word, to, to, who are like civilized, and the others are underdeveloped, they are, it's a, it's a problematic argument also for historical reason to think about, uh, you know, uh, the world divided in this way. Actually, my, my own experience from, I mean, traveling in the world, in the world and but also in Switzerland, that, you know, in Switzerland there are many people who are, in my view, uh, not, who don't have this high political culture in a way, as you understand it, who, you know, don't care about uh, common good, who are, um, who don't know who are, know anything about politics or uh, don't know, um, any member of parliament, you know, sometimes I even do this uh, quiz to my students of political science. I think one third is able to give me two names of members of parliament, two, out of 246. And these are university students of political science, okay? So my first reaction is that, you know, it's, uh, uh, we should not divide the world about you know people who have political culture or who don't have it, and and actually I think that one the big promise of democracy is precisely uh, that's John Stuart Mill's argument <laughs> that it can also have educative effects on uh, uh, it 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 gives the people even let's say people without education without especially, I mean, John Stuart Mill, it was 1860, you know, you, you can think of a number of people who didn't know to read or to write, but he was in favor of democracy, uh, to give them at least one vote, then of course he would have given more votes to those who are better educated, but, but at least one vote to, even to people who are not educated, who, and he saw democracy as something that could actually be positive, uh, instrumentally positive, uh, uh, for uh, precisely for, for, for educating people and improving their political culture. And in a way, if I believe also in these mini publics, it's also because I do believe that ordinary citizens without too high knowledge of institutions, politics, etc., they are able, if you give them the possibility, they are able to, 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 to make an opinion uh, for themselves about a political issue to to say if they want a new airport or they don't want a new airport, to understand the issues at stake. But you need to give them the possibility. You need, you know, 
these, the idea of mini publics is to give them five days or whatever uh, to discuss, to, to be informed, to, uh, and I believe in that. And otherwise, I mean, the fact that you do have democracy uh, even in, in the poorest countries of the world, like at least elections, we know it's not perfect. We know uh, when people don't have enough to eat, uh, they, they, they are much more subject to, to, to influence the people who's, who tell them, you know, vote for my party and I will give you $10 or whatever. Uh, we know that, but still we, we think that it's better to have a system where uh, we do have elections than have a, a, a dictatorship. Uh, yeah, I don't know what can I say more about that. But it's, I, I, I see your, your point, and I, and I, and I, and I see that it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate question to ask. But one, uh, one thing, I only want to add that I, I, I'm not against democracy, but I, um, I have concerns with direct democracy, with all this process of referendums, uh, like uh, when you, you can put a, a social issue or, or political issue um, uh, for everyone to vote, and maybe there are cases and there are things that you shouldn't take the risk of putting in the hands of people that maybe are susceptible to be influenced, uh, uh, to be manipulated by uh, populist politicians. No, that, no, that's no, what I'm saying. No, but no, I'm I, not I, against I, democracy. I believe a lot of democracy, but I have my concerns with yeah. this. No, 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 I can see that. But my answer to this kind of objection to that democracy is that the kind of arguments that you use are precisely the arguments that you can use against democracy as such. Because, I mean, uh, look at what happened in Brazil. That was not direct democracy. That was elections. They could choose between uh, different candidates for the presidency, and you saw what they did, you know. But is this, is, is, is this uh, uh, an example, or is this uh, uh, the reason to say we should now abolish uh, elections because the people were, uh, you know, call them whatever you know, they, they, they voted for, 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 such a, for such a person, or the people who voted for Trump in the United States. Is that the reason to abolish presidential elections? I don't think so. And for me, the, exactly the same reasons are the reasons why should we not say that we should abolish or not have direct democracy. Because again, the reasons that you put forward are exactly the reasons that you can put forward against democracy as such. But, but I do respect your, what you said, that you are not against democracy as such. I'm, I'm just saying that uh, the reasons you, the, the, the kind of arguments that you've used can be used against uh, elections as well. Eh, voy a hablar en español. Eh, que democracia... Tiene que hablar despacio. Okay. despacio so maybe I can try in English. No, no, no. no. Okay. Habla oh, en okay. español. So, I, I mean, I think uh, direct democracy is like really good way to make a decision about things. But, I mean, I've seen um, exercises of the direct democracy in Switzerland. I think it's really great, but... I wonder, in the, case, in the case of Mexico, for instance, where the people tend to work like 48 hours per week and with only one week of holidays per year. So then when the people can uh, take the time to uh, think and make the whole process of gathering uh, signatures or whatever, and uh, taking in account this reality of the people who set the agenda. I mean, who have the time to do that? Because if we have like 50% of people with these social conditions, then we will have a few people that will be able to do that, to be in charge of that. And then you can say that Unions may give people some hours to do these things, but in Mexico we have a long tradition of cooperative unions that tend um, to do what the party in the power or some uh, 
elites or whatever you want to name it, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they do what they want they do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, my English, but yeah, that's understood. the idea. No, no, I understood the question. Well, uh, okay, so the, basically the question is that, um, yeah, uh, in order to really, yeah, uh, to, to really use direct democracy and to be able to vote, to inform yourself, you need resources, you need time, you you need perhaps also money to buy a newspaper or, or to uh, have a, uh, you know, to pay for your television or whatever, the, you know, the sources of information. So you need some resources. Uh, well, I, I acknowledge that this is a, a, a practical difficulty that could be something more difficult to achieve uh, in a country where people don't have resources, don't have time because uh, they work uh, uh, 10 hours a day and have no vacation, etc. Um, well, w w one possible answer is to say that, well, if you had a possibility, you, you know, uh, uh, to launch a, a proposal saying, no, we want to work 42 hours, then perhaps, you know, these people who work 48 or 8 hours, you know, they don't need a lot of time to understand that that's in their interest and to go out and vote. Or, uh, you know, we want three weeks of vacation a year, not only one week. Um, I don't see why people wouldn't see the importance of such thing. Uh, and and it's, it's not necessarily, uh, of course, it will then depend on the context of do, do people really need uh, or want to, you know, uh, have three weeks of vacation or, or whatever. Actually, in Switzerland, uh, we did have a proposal uh, uh, perhaps eight years, ten years ago, to have, um, what was that, five? Because a typical um, average uh, weeks of vacation is four weeks. And I think there was a proposal to have five weeks. And, um, and I think in, 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 in many other countries, the people were completely amazed that this, the majority of Swiss said, no, we don't want five weeks. So they rejected the proposal to have one week more vacation because uh, the majority thought that uh, uh, you know, we need also to work and uh, if we have too many vacations then uh, there will be uh, some problems with the economy, etc. And so they rejected the proposal. Uh, but you did have a discussion about that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Perhaps that doesn't answer completely your, your question, but uh, but do feel free to okay. Uh, so to it, put it differently. Yeah. It's how this. I mean, it's how that the people don't have time to think about this about anything because if you work ten hours per day, six days per week, and then you have two hours to get your place or whatever, and then you have only one week uh, or vacation, then what kind of political reflection can you do if you believe in that situation? And then, I mean, I think that this drives to this drives to the thing that, in that case, who set the agenda of the things that should be asked in a thing of in in an atmosphere of direct democracy? Because if you don't have if you don't have the tools of do that, the time or whatever you need to do that, then something else will do that. So. I see a kind of a problem there. What, I'm, what we're going to do is take a few more questions, put them all together, and then you can have one last intervention to address them all or just some of them that you like. All right, so who else would like to raise a question? So, okay, Fernando back there can go ahead. And then you bring the mic to me because I want to raise a few questions as well. Sure. Okay, so um, kind of uh, out of the box question, but I was more interested in the moral philosophy side of direct democracy and um, thinking about virtue ethics, if direct democracy can help people exercise virtue and from a deontology point of view, if can help people exercise character and if and this, this would be the question if, you, if an, another question, if you would have a recommendation of a moral defense of direct democracy that uh, uses um, any branch of, of moral philosophy um, being virtue ethics, deontology, utilitarianism, etc. Thank you. Let me. 
Okay, so let me put some questions also on the table. So this is a, a very interesting project, of course. Um, as you said, there is very little literature on this, so I'm really happy that you're working on it. Um, it has great challenges, but it's also a very stimulating and, and promising project, so I just want to congratulate you. Okay, so l l let me raise a few critical questions, or just challenges that I think you would have to address in this project. So one of them is the following. So the, the, the way you're presenting the case for direct democracy, you're construing direct democracy uh, as something intermediate between representative democracy and the Athenian model, right? So you called it semi-direct democracy. So you're saying we're still going to have the, re the, the, the standard representative institutions, but then we're going to have some instances in which the people will directly decide on some issues, right? Mm -hmm. um, it would be uh, the people would supplement, right, the the, mm -hmm. the workings of of uh, representative institutions as we know them. So, so I think one big challenge here is to identify a principled basis for this sort of division of labor, right? So, uh, a way of identifying when and why some kinds of issues uh, would be decided by the people as a whole. Uh, the, 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 the challenge or the worry here is um, that you might find a kind of slippery slope problem, right? So if the people are competent enough or it's good enough to allow people to decide some issues, then why, why not allow them to, de to decide um, everything? So why not uh, move all the way to uh, an Athenian style of democracy if we have the technology to do it? So, um, so exactly where in the middle and on what principled basis do you, you know, propose that the people should intervene in the, in the decision-making uh, process? And this is related to another question, which is, so in, in, in answering some of the questions you've said, um, that, uh, well, perhaps, probably, you know, if it is the case that direct democracy or semi-direct democracy is not vulnerable to the risks of populism, then it might not be worse than what we have. Uh, but you seem to be making so far a, a case for the permissibility of direct democracy rather than trying to persuade us that we have to actually adopt it. Uh, I, I'm still. Can, can, can you repeat? Yes. That? So, so, so you, you, you've said so far that uh, it is possible, perhaps likely, that um, to, to find ways to prevent direct democracy from uh, becoming a tool for populists, that it might be a bad thing, and uh, you, act, you you invite us to compare what we already have, representative democracy, mm -hmm. with all, with all its defects. Mm -hmm with, you know, this alternative, you know, with the adoption of direct democracy measures. And you say, look, I mean, we might not be in the end worse, as people say. So that, if that is the case, then that would be an argument for the permissibility of adopting these direct democracy measures. But it doesn't sound like a very compelling case in terms of, you know, convincing people to adopt them, right? So what would be the more positive case for, for doing this? Right, so you, you seem to be saying, look, I mean, things might not be all that bad if we adopt this, but what is really the advantage of of uh, of doing this? Why why should we um, go for 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 direct democracy? I have other other questions or remarks, but we can discuss them later. So I'm going to leave this here, and you don't have to answer all these questions, but. Um, so just take a, a few, you know, minutes for a last round of answers. Okay. Is there anybody else here? I don't think so, no. Okay. 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 Um, uh, the question about slippery slope. Um, yes, I think that uh, in, in, in the kind of uh, system 
a complex system, which is perhaps a little bit, as I said, it's not quite correct to call it simply direct democracy. It's semi-direct democracy or uh, direct democracy that coexists with institutions of representative democracy and in my view should also consist, um, coexist with institutions of deliberative democracy. So we should go probably towards this, uh, uh, as, as there is this new literature on deliberative dem systems, um, what was the, 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 the system approach to deliberative democracy, uh, we should also, I think, uh, or I should, in my, my project, uh, think of, um, of, of uh, a system where direct democracy is one part of the puzzle. Uh, okay, but in this system, uh, in my view, people should be able to decide uh, issues, uh, whichever issues they want. The question is, should they be asked about any single issue? The answer is no. I mean, there should be a demand. That's why, you, I mean, the idea of facultative referendums is precisely that you leave, you leave the parliament do its work. You leave the, and the parliament leaves the executive branch and the, or the administration, etc., etc. But if a group of people think, no, no, we want to decide on this issue, they can ask through collecting signatures. Uh, you put a, you know you put a threshold, or, okay, like in, in Switzerland, one percent of of, of fifty thousand. Uh, signatures are, are, are sufficient to call a referendum. And then you have a popular vote where everybody who wants to vote can vote. Okay, so any, any, any issue voted by parliament can be put on the referendum. But th there must be a demand. So this, in a way, is a, uh, is a practical answer to, to, the, to the slippery slope argument in a way that uh, I think that, I, I even think that I'm against, for instance, uh, uh, even the, the division of labor in, that you can find in, in, in theories of constitutional democracy where you say, well, there are some things that, uh, like the eternity clause in the German constitution, you know, some things are here for eternity. No popular majority, no parliamentary majority can do that. I don't agree. I, I think that uh, if we really want, uh, if we really believe in democracy as an expression of the ideal of uh, individual self-determination, I'm the only owner of, you know, myself as an individual. Uh, you know, the, 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 the people should be able to uh, to decide according to to procedures that should be uh, on, on on any issue, even like uh, you know some some very bad things. If it, which, which doesn't mean that I don't believe in the um, in, 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 in the value of civic resistance. And you know, if really you have a, a fascist government or fascist de decision taken by popular vote, uh, as an individual, you have a moral obligation <laughs> to resist such fascism, like or, or, or um, racist measure, like let's kick out all red people from this country, or blue, or white, or black, or whatever. Uh, and the majority says, yes, we want that. Okay. Then we'll, you know, in, in the, the, the French anthem says, uh, aux armes citoyens, take your arms and we'll fight, you know, in, 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 in the final, in, in the final uh, scenario. Um, yeah, that, that's, I don't know if that's answered, but, but uh, but, 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 but perhaps I, let, let me go a bit, let me connect with the question of, of, of uh, I don't know your name, but Fernando. Fernando. Uh, uh, so why, why don't we go all the way through to have the Ath Athenian kind of uh, people gathering on the square and raising hands in order to vote? Well, the, 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 this is something that, that, that in, in the complex system of uh, democracy, it still exists in some places uh, in Switzerland. There are two cantons there that still have this people gathering on the square and taking decision by raising their hands. And 
Why do, do I think that it connects with, with, with your question? Because, okay, I'm not a moral philosopher, so I'm not able to give you, you know, okay. But there is the, uh, the, the, the kind of um, uh, literature that I would, you know, I use to answer is the quite recent literature on the ethics of voting, you know. Um, your friend uh, Julia Meskivir, what, 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 what was it? Maskivka, yeah. Uh, she has uh, an interesting paper in political studies on, on, you know, why would we have a duty to vote and why is this, uh, I think it goes in the, in the direction of your, <laughs> um, um, but so if you gather on a square, okay, and you take decisions by raising hands, uh, you can, you know, object that on many, like, it, 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 it violates the secrecy of vote, etc. But it asks question, okay, but why is the secrecy of voting something that we should cherish in democracy? You know? Uh, you will find some people, uh, Philip Pettit and Jeffrey Brennan, the other Brennan, has an interesting article in uh, 1990 where they are, where they uh, explain why we should actually be in favor of open voting. As that used to be the case in the 19th century. Something. And then at some point the secrecy became, you know, uh, and the argument there is that if the vote is open, the people will um, be more inclined to vote for the common good, for the common interest, not for, not for their personal interests. Uh, that's at least the argument that Philip Pettit makes there. And, uh, and there are some interesting recent empirical studies on these two Swiss cantons that do use this. Actually kind of uh, 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 confirming <laughs> that you do have some decisions like even some populist uh, proposals. Like now in Switzerland we have a big debate about banning the burqa, you know, the niqab for women, okay? We don't have almost nobody on the street, you know, some Arab tourists perhaps, but you know. But this is a typical, you know, populist proposal you know, uh, taking advantage, advantage of this Islamophobia, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so we, do, we did have in two cantons, uh, one was a month ago in Canton St. Gallen, and in my canton, Ticino, in Italian speaking Switzerland, uh, four years ago. So we did have cantonal uh, popular initiatives demanding the, ma the ban of burqa, and they succeeded. Okay, majority said, yes, we want to ban burqa. Or, of course, they didn't. They were clever enough not to uh, to put that in that. Uh, you know, saying we ban the burqa, we ban. Uh, it's not allowed to cover your face. You know, okay, for any reason, not for any. Okay, but de facto, it was. You know, they wanted to. Okay. So you had this very same populist proposal put on vote in this open square where people raise hands. And the majority said no to this issue. Or a couple of years earlier, they said, yes, we want to allow 16-year-old to vote, not only 18-year, but to, to lower. Whereas in all other places in Switzerland, they said, no, no, 16-year-old, they're too ignorant, etc. No. In this assembly, where at that point only people above 18 could vote, they said, no, we want to allow 16-year-old. So in a way, they took some progressive decisions and uh, there are people who say that it is because the vote was, was open and not secret. Okay. I don't know if this goes a little bit too far away, but, but uh, it, it is in a way, the, uh, it addresses the question of Athenian democracy because that's the, clo the, no, the, the, the closest you can get. Uh, uh, um, um. Oh, okay. Uh, and then... Um, yeah, okay. In that case, so we'll, we'll, the, the, your second question about, uh, about pers permissibility. Uh, yeah, that, that in a way I was too defensive to say, oh, let's say direct democracy because it's not much worse than uh, representative democracy. Uh, but I, I, I do, in fact, uh, I mean, the, 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 the positive case is that, uh, and, and here I, I, might, I might refer to uh, Michael Soward, uh, the book 
1998, the terms of democracy, where you will find arguments saying that if you really cherish democracy, there is no principled argument against being in favor of direct democracy. It could be only uh, arguments of, in terms of practicability, um, you know, can you really have this in a country with many millions of people, etc., etc. But in principle, that the fact that people, individuals, as people who having voting rights should have uh, the, 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 the possibility to, to implement the ideal of political equality, uh, uh, having the right to vote, uh, you can, it's difficult to find the arguments then against direct democracy from this perspective. I don't know if this answers your question. Okay. Well, thank you very much again, thank you. Nana, for being here. And I will do my best next time to, to do my lesson in Spanish, but I, will, I still, uh, when, you, when you speak so, such nice English, it's, <laughs> unfortunately, it's not necessary. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I hope we'll, 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 we'll say hi to I, I will. Thank you. Right. Yeah. My students are Swiss companies, so. Really? No, no, no.